Chapter Eleven of Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Cottagers. As I now had only one regular pupil, though she contrived to give me as much trouble as three or four ordinary ones, and though her sister still took lessons in German and drawing, I had considerably more time at my own disposal than I had ever been blessed with before since I had taken upon me the governess's yoke. Which time I devoted partly to correspondence with my friends, partly to reading, study, and the practice of music, singing, etc., partly to wandering in the grounds or adjacent fields, with my pupils if they wanted me, alone if they did not. Often, when they had no more agreeable occupation at hand, the Mrs. Murrays would amuse themselves with visiting the poor cottagers on their father's estate, to receive their flattering homage, or to hear the old stories or gossiping news of the garrulous old women, or perhaps to enjoy the purer pleasure of making the poor people happy with their cheering presence and their occasional gifts, so easily bestowed, so thankfully received. Sometimes I was called upon to accompany one or both of the sisters in these visits, and sometimes I was desired to go alone, to fulfil some promise which they had been more ready to make than to perform, to carry some small donation, or read to one who was sick or seriously disposed, and thus I made a few acquaintances among the cottagers, and occasionally I went to see them on my own account. I generally had more satisfaction in going alone than with either of the young ladies, for they, chiefly owing to their defective education, comported themselves towards their inferiors in a manner that was highly disagreeable for me to witness. They never, in thought, exchanged places with them, and consequently had no consideration for their feelings, regarding them as an order of beings entirely different from themselves. They would watch the poor creatures at their meals, making uncivil remarks about their food and their manner of eating. They would laugh at their simple notions and provincial expressions, till some of them scarcely durst venture to speak. They would call the grave elderly men and women old fools and silly old blockheads to their faces, and all this without meaning to offend. I could see that the people were often hurt and annoyed by such conduct though their fear of the grand ladies prevented them from testifying any resentment, but they never perceived it. They thought that, as these cottagers were poor and untaught, they must be stupid and brutish, and as long as they, their superiors, condescended to talk to them and to give them shillings and half-crowns, or articles of clothing, they had a right to amuse themselves, even at their expense, and the people must adore them as angels of light, condescending to minister to their necessities, and enlighten their humble dwellings. I made many and various attempts to deliver my pupils from these delusive notions without alarming their pride, which was easily offended and not soon appeased, but with little apparent result, and I know not which was the more reprehensible of the two. Matilda was more rude and boisterous, but from Rosalie's womanly age and ladylike exterior better things were expected, yet she was as provokingly careless and inconsiderate as a giddy child of twelve. One bright day, in the last week of February, I was walking in the park, enjoying the threefold luxury of solitude, a book, and pleasant weather, for Miss Matilda had set out on her daily ride, and Miss Murray was gone in the carriage with her mamma to pay some morning calls. But it struck me that I ought to leave these selfish pleasures, and the park with its glorious canopy of bright blue sky, the west wind sounding through its yet leafless branches, snow wreaths still lingering in its hollows, but melting fast beneath the sun, and the graceful deer browsing on its moist herbage, already assuming the freshness and verdure of spring, and go to the cottage of one Nancy Brown, a widow, whose son was at work all day in the fields, and who was afflicted with an inflammation in the eyes, which had for some time incapacitated her from reading, to her own great grief, for she was a woman of serious, thoughtful turn of mind. I accordingly went and found her alone, as usual, in her little, close, dark cottage, 
redolent of smoke and confined air, but as tidy and clean as she could make it. She was seated beside her little fire, consisting of a few red cinders and a bit of stick, busily knitting, with a small sackcloth cushion at her feet, placed for the accommodation of her gentle friend the cat, who was seated thereon, with her long tail half encircling her velvet paws, and her half-closed eyes dreamily gazing on the low, crooked fender. "'Well, Nancy, how are you to-day?' "'Why, middling, miss, in the cell. "'My eyes is no better, but I'm a deal easier in my mind nor I have been,' replied she, rising to welcome me with a contented smile, which I was glad to see, for Nancy had been somewhat afflicted with religious melancholy. I congratulated her upon the change. She agreed that it was a great blessing, and expressed herself right down thankful for it, adding, "'If it please God to spare my sight, and make me so I can read my Bible again, I think I shall be as happy as a queen.' "'I hope he will, Nancy,' replied I. "'And meantime I'll come to read to you now and then, when I have a little time to spare.' With expressions of grateful pleasure, the poor woman moved to get me a chair, but as I saved her the trouble, she busied herself with stirring the fire, and adding a few more sticks to the decaying embers, then, taking her well-used Bible from the shelf, dusted it carefully, and gave it me. On my asking if there was any particular part she should like me to read, she answered, "'Well, Miss Gray, if it's all the same to you, I should like to hear the chapter in the first epistle of St. John, that says, "'God is love.' and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. With a little searching I found these words in the fourth chapter. When I came to the seventh verse she interrupted me, and, with needless apologies for such a liberty, desired me to read it very slowly, that she might take it all in, and dwell on every word, hoping I would excuse her as she was but a simple body. The wisest person, I replied, might think over each of these verses for an hour and be all the better for it, and I would rather read them slowly than not. Accordingly, I finished the chapter as slowly as need be, and at the same time as impressively as I could. My auditor listened most attentively all the while, and sincerely thanked me when I had done. I sat still about half a minute to give her time to reflect upon it when, somewhat to my surprise, she broke the pause by asking me how I liked Mr. Weston. "'I don't know,' I replied, a little startled by the suddenness of the question. "'I think he preaches very well.' "'Ay, he does so, and talks well, too.' "'Does he?' "'He does. Maybe you haven't seen him. Not to talk to him much yet.' "'No, I never see anyone to talk to.' except the young ladies of the hall. Ah, they're nice, kind young ladies, but they can't talk as he does. Then he comes to see you, Nancy. He does, miss, and I's thankful for it. He comes to see all us poor bodies a deal oftener nor Mr. Bly, nor the rector ever did. And it's well he does, for he's always welcome. We can't say as much for the rector. There is that that says they're fair feared on him, when he comes into a house, they say he's sure to find summat wrong, and begin a calling him as soon as he crosses the Dorsons. But maybe he thinks it is his duty to tell them what's wrong, and very oft he comes a purpose to reprove folk for not coming to church, or not kneeling and standing when the other folk does, or going through the Methody Chapel, or summat of the sort. But I can't say that he ever found much fault with me. He come to see me once or twice, afore Mr. Weston come when I was so ill-troubled in my mind, and as I had only very poor health besides, I made bold to send for him, and he came right enough, and I was sore distressed, Miss Gray, thank God it's o'er now. But when I took my Bible I could get no comfort of it at all. That very chapter that you've been reading troubled me as much as aught. He that loveth not knoweth not God. It seemed fearsome to me, for I felt that I loved neither God nor man as I should do, and could not, if I tried, ever so. In the chapter 4, where it says, He that is born of God cannot commit sin, and another place where it says, 
love is the fulfilling of the law and many many others miss i should fare weary you out if i was to tell them all but all seemed to condemn me and to show me that i was not in the right way and as i knew not how to get into it i sent our bill to beg master atfield to be as kind as to look in on me some day and when he came i told him all my troubles and what did he say nancy why miss he seemed to scorn me i might be mistaken but he gave a sort of whistle and i saw a bit of a smile on his face and he said oh it's all stuff you've been among the methodists my good woman but i told him i'd never been near the methodies and then he said well says he you must come to church where you'll hear the scriptures properly explained instead of sitting poring over your bible at home but i told him i always used coming to church when i had my health but this very cold winter weather i hardly durst venture so far and me so bad with rheumatic and all but he says it'll do your rheumatiz good to hobble to church there is nothing like exercise for the rheumatiz you can walk about the house well enough why can't you walk to church the fact is says he you're getting too fond of your ease it's always easy to find excuses for shirking one's duty but then you know miss gray it wasn't so however i told him i'd try but please sir says i if i do go to church what better shall i be i want to have my sins blotted out and to feel that they are remembered no more against me and that the love of god is shed abroad in my heart and if i can get no good by reading my bible and saying my prayers at home what good shall i get by going to church the church says he is the place appointed by god for his worship it's your duty to go there as often as you can if you want comfort you must seek it in the path of duty and a deal more he said but i can't remember all his fine words however it all came to this that i was to come to church as often as ever i could and bring my prayer book with me and read up all the sponsors after the clerk and stand and kneel and sit and do all as i should and take the lord's supper at every opportunity and hearken his sermons and master Bly's, and that it'd be all right if i went on doing my duty i should get a blessing at last but if you get no comfort that way says he it's all up then sir says i should you think i am a reprobate why says he he says if you do your best to get to heaven and can't manage it you must be one of those that seek to enter in at the straight gate and shall not be able and then he asked me if i'd seen any of the ladies at all about that morning so i told him where i had seen the young missus go on the moss lane and he kicked my poor cat right across the floor and went after him as gay as a lark but i was very sad that last word of his fair sunk into my heart and laid there like a lump of lead till i was weary to bear it howsoever i followed his advice i thought he meant it all for the best though he had a queer way with him but you know miss he's rich and young and such like cannot right understand the thoughts of a poor old woman such as me but howsoever i did my best to do as he bade me but maybe i'm plaguing you miss with my chatter oh no nancy go on and tell me all well my rheumatiz got better i know not whether i was going to church or not but one frosty sunday i got this cold in my eyes the inflammation didn't come on all at once like but bit by bit i wasn't going to tell you about my eyes i was thinking about my trouble of mind and to tell the truth miss gray i don't think it was any ways eased by coming to church not to speak on at least i like got my health better but that didn't mend my soul i hearkened and hearkened the ministers and read and read at my prayer book but it was all like the sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal the sermons i couldn't understand and the prayer book only served to show me how wicked i was that i could read such good words and ne'er be no better for it as often feel in sore labour and a heavy task besides instead of a blessing and a privilege as all good christians does it seemed like as all were barren and dark to me and then them dreadful words many shall seek to enter in and shall not be able they like as they fair dried up my spirit but one sunday when mr atfield gave out about the sacrament 
I noticed where he said, If there be any of you that cannot quiet his own conscience, but requireth further comfort or counsel, let him come to me, or some other discreet and learned minister of God's word, and open his grief. So, next Sunday morning, afore service, I just looked into the vestry, and began a talking to the rector again. I could hardly fashion to take such a liberty, but I thought when my soul was at stake I shouldn't stick out a trifle. But he said he hadn't time to attend to me then. And indeed, says he, I have nothing to say to you but what I've said before. Take the sacrament, of course, and go on doing your duty. And if that won't serve you, nothing will. So don't bother me any more. So then I went away. But I heard Mr. Weston. Mr. Weston was there, miss, this on his first Sunday at Horton, you know. And he was in the vestry in his surplice, helping the rector on with his gown. Yes, Nancy. And I heard him ask Mr. Hatfield who I was, and he says, oh, she's a canting old fool. And I was very ill-grieved, Miss Gray. But I went to my seat, and I tried to do my duties aforetime, but I like got no peace. And even as I took the sacrament, I felt as though I were eating and drinking to my own damnation of the time. So I went home sorely troubled. But the next day, before I'd gotten fettled up, for indeed, miss, I'd no heart to sweeping and fettling and washing pots, so I sat me down in the muck. Who should come in but Master Weston? I started sighting stuff then, and sweeping and doing, and I expected he'd begin a-calling me for my idle ways, as Master Atfield would have done. But I was mistaken. He only bid me good morning, like, in quite a decent way. So I dusted him a chair and fettled up the fireplace a bit, but I hadn't forgotten the rector's words. So, says I, I wonder, sir, you should give yourself that trouble to come so far to see a canting old fool such as me. He seemed taken aback at that, but he would fain persuade me that the rector was only in jest, and when that wouldn't do, he says, Well, Nancy, you shouldn't think so much about it. Mr. Atfield was a little out of humour just then. You know we're none of us perfect. Even Moses spoke unadvisedly with his lips. But now sit down a minute, if you can spare the time, and tell me all your doubts and fears, and I'll try to remove them. So I sat me down and ent him. He was quite a stranger, you know, Miss Gray, and even younger nor Mr. Atfield, I believe, and I had thought him not so pleasant-looking as him, but rather a bit crossish, at first, to look at. But he spake so civil-like, and when the cat, poor thing, jumped onto his knee, he only stroked her and gave her a bit of a smile, and I thought that was a good sign, for once, when she did so, the rector knocked her off, like as it might be in scorn and anger, poor thing. But you can't expect a cat to know manners like a Christian, you know, Miss Gray. No, of course not, Nancy. But what did Mr. Weston say then? He said not. But listen to me as steady and patient as could be, never bit of scorn about him. So I went on and told him all, just as I have told you, and more, too. Well, says he, Mr. Atfield was quite right in telling you to persevere in doing your duty, but in advising you to go to church and attend to the service and so on, he didn't mean that was the whole of a Christian's duty. He only thought you might there learn what more was to be done, and be led to take delight in those exercises instead of finding him a task and a burden. And if you had asked him to explain those words that trouble you so much, I think he would have told you that if many shall seek to enter at the straight gate and shall not be able it is their own sin that hinder him just as a man with a large sack on his back might wish to pass through a narrow doorway and find it impossible to do so unless he would leave a sack behind him but you nancy i dare say have no sins that you would not gladly throw aside if you knew how indeed sir you speak the truth said i well says he you know the first and great commandment and the second, which is like unto it, on which two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You say you cannot love God, but it strikes me that if you rightly consider who and what he is, you cannot help it. He is your father, your best friend. Every blessing, everything good, pleasant, or useful comes from him. And everything evil, everything you have reason to hate, to shun, or to fear, comes from Satan, his enemy as well as ours. And for this cause, 
was God manifest in the flesh, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In one word, God is love. And the more of love we have within us, the nearer we are to him, and the more of his spirit we possess. Well, sir, says I, if I can always think on these things, I think I might well love God. But how can I love my neighbors when they vex me and be so contrary and sinful as some of them is? It may seem a hard matter, says he, to love our neighbors who have so much of what is evil about them, and whose faults so often awaken the evil that linger within ourselves. But remember that he made them, and he loves them. And whosoever loveth him that begat, loveth him that is begotten also. And if God so loveth us, that he gave his only begotten Son to die for us, we ought to love one another. But if you cannot feel positive affection for those who do not care for you, you can at least try to do to them as you would they should do unto you. You can endeavor to pity their failings and excuse their offenses, and to do all the good you can to those about you. And if you accustom yourself to this, Nancy, the very effort itself will make you love them in some degree, to say nothing of the good will your kindness would beget in them, though they might have little else that is good about them. If we love God and wish to serve Him, let us try to be like Him, to do His work, to labor for His glory, which is the good of man, to hasten the coming of His kingdom, which is the peace and happiness of all the world, however powerless we may seem to be, in doing all the good we can through life, the humblest of us may do much towards it, and let us dwell in love, that he may dwell in us and we in him. The more happiness we bestow, the more we shall receive, even here, and the greater will be our reward in heaven when we rest from our labors. I believe, miss, them is his very words, for I've thought him o'er many a time, and then he took that Bible and read bits here and there, and explained them as clear as the day, and it seemed like a new light broke in on my soul, and I felt fair glow about my heart, and only wished poor Bill and all the world could have been there, and heard it all and rejoiced with me. After he was gone, Hannah Rogers, one of the neighbors, came in and wanted me to help her wash. I told her I couldn't just then, for I hadn't set the potatoes on for dinner, nor washed up the breakfast stuff yet. Then she began a calling me for my nasty idle ways. I was a little bit vexed at first, but I never said nothing wrong to her. I only told her like all in a quiet way, and I'd add the new parson to see me. I'd get it done as quick as ever I could, and then come and help her. So then she softened down, and my heart like as it worn towards her, and in a bit we was very good friends. And so it is, Miss Gray. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. It isn't only in them you speak to, but in yourself. Very true, Nancy, if we could always remember it. Ay, if we could. And did Mr. Weston ever come to see you again? Yes, many a time. And since my eyes has been so bad, he sat and read me by the half-hour together. But you know, miss, he has other folks to see, and other things to do, God bless him. And that next Sunday he preached such a sermon. His text was, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And them two blessed verses that follows. You wasn't there, miss. You was with your friends then. But it made me so happy. And I am happy now. Thank God. And I take a pleasure now in doing little bits of jobs for my neighbors, such as a poor old body that's half blind can do, and they take it kindly of me, just as he said. You see, miss, I'm knitting a pair of stockings now. They're for Thomas Jackson. He's a queerish old body. And we've had many about at threeping, one unto another, and at times we've differed sorely. But I thought I couldn't do better nor knit him a pair of warm stockings, and I felt like to him a deal better, poor old man, than I begin. It's turned out just as Mr. Weston said. Well, I'm very glad to see you so happy, Nancy, and so wise. But I must get on now. I shall be wanted at the hall, said I. And bidding her good-bye, I departed, 
promising to come again when I had time, and feeling nearly as happy as herself. At another time I went to read to a poor labourer who was in the last stage of consumption. The young ladies had been to see him, and somehow a promise of breathing had been extracted from them. But it was too much trouble, so they begged me to do it instead. I went willingly enough, and there too I was gratified with the praises of Mr. Weston, both from the sick man and his wife. The former told me that he derived a great deal of comfort and benefit from the visits of the new parson, who frequently came to see him, and was another guest sort of man to Mr. Hatfield, who before the other's arrival at Horton had now and then paid him a visit, on which occasions he would always insist upon having the cottage door kept open, to admit the fresh air for his own convenience, without considering how it might injure the sufferer, and having opened his prayer-book, and hastily read over a part of the service for the sick, would hurry away again, if he did not stay to administer some harsh rebuke to the afflicted wife, or to make some thoughtless, not to say heartless, observation, rather calculated to increase than to diminish the troubles of the suffering pair. Whereas, said the man, Mr. Weston had pulled me quite in a different fashion, and talked to me as kind as out, and off read to me, and sit beside me just like a brother. "'Just for all the world,' exclaimed his wife. "'And about a three weeks in, when he seed our poor Jem shivered with cold, and what pitiful fires we keep, he asked if our stock of coals was nearly done. I told him it was, and we was ill set to get more. But you know, mum, I didn't think of him helping us. But howsoever, he sent us a stack of coals the next day, and we've had good fires ever since. And a great blessing it is this winter time. But that's his way, Miss Gray. When he comes into a poor body's house a seein' sick folk, he like notices what they most stand in need of, and if he thinks they can't readily get it themselves, he never says naught about it, but just gets it for em. And it isn't every one to do that has as little as he has. For you know, mum, he's now at all to live on but what he gets from the rector. And that's little enough, they say. I remembered then, with a species of exultation, that he had frequently been styled a vulgar brute by the amiable Miss Murray, because he wore a silver watch, and clothes not quite so bright and fresh as Mr. Hatfield's. In returning to the lodge, I felt happy, and thanked God that I now had something to think about, something to dwell on as a relief from the weary monotony, the lonely drudgery of my present life for I was lonely. Never, from month to month, from year to year, except during my brief intervals of rest at home, did I see one creature to whom I could open my heart, or freely speak my thoughts with any hope of sympathy, or even comprehension. Never one, unless it were poor Nancy Brown, with whom I could enjoy a single moment of real social intercourse, or whose conversation was calculated to render me better, wiser, or happier than before, or who, as far as I could see, could be greatly benefited by mine. My only companions had been unamiable children and ignorant, wrong-headed girls, from whose fatiguing folly unbroken solitude was often a relief most earnestly desired and dearly prized, but to be restricted to such associates was a serious evil, both in its immediate effects and the consequences that were likely to ensue. Never a new idea or stirring thought came to me from without, and such as rose within me were, for the most part, miserably crushed at once, or doomed to sicken or fade away, because they could not see the light. Habitual associates are known to exercise a great influence over each other's minds and manners. Those whose actions are forever before our eyes, whose words are ever in our ears, will naturally lead us, albeit against our will, slowly, gradually, imperceptibly perhaps, to act and speak as they do. I will not presume to say how far this irresistible power of assimilation extends, but if one civilized man were doomed to pass a dozen years amid a race of intractable savages, unless he had power to improve them, I greatly question whether, at the close of that period, 
he would not have become at least a barbarian himself. And I, as I could not make my young companions better, feared exceedingly that they would make me worse, would gradually bring my feelings, habits, capacities to the level of their own, without, however, imparting to me their light-heartedness and cheerful vivacity. Already I seemed to feel my intellect deteriorating, my heart petrifying, my soul contracting, and I trembled lest my very mortal perception should become deadened, my distinctions of right and wrong confounded, and all my better faculties be sunk at last beneath the baneful influence of such a mode of life. The gross vapours of earth were gathering around me, and closing in upon my inward heaven. And thus it was that Mr. Weston rose at length upon me, appearing like the morning star in my horizon, to save me from the fear of utter darkness, and I rejoiced that I had now a subject for contemplation that was above me, not beneath. I was glad to see that all the world was not made up of Bloomfields, Murrays, Hatfields, Ashbys, etc., and that human excellence was not a mere dream of the imagination. When we hear a little good and no harm of a person, it is easy and pleasant to imagine more. In short, it is needless to analyze all my thoughts. But Sunday was now become a day of peculiar delight to me. I was now almost broken in to the back corner of the carriage, for I liked to hear him, and I liked to see him too, though I knew he was not handsome, nor even what is called agreeable, in outward aspect. But certainly he was not ugly. In stature he was a little, a very little, above the middle size. The outline of his face would be pronounced too square for beauty, but to me it announced decision of character. His dark brown hair was not carefully curled like Mr. Hatfield's, but simply brushed aside over a white forehead. The eyebrows, I supposed, were too projecting. But from under those dark brows there gleamed an eye of singular power, brown in color, not large and somewhat deep-set, but strikingly brilliant and full of expression. There was character, too, in the mouth something that bespoke a man a firm purpose and a habitual thinker. And when he smiled, but I will not speak of that yet, for at the time I mentioned I had never seen him smile. And indeed, his general appearance did not impress me with the idea of a man given to such a relaxation, nor of such an individual as the cottagers described him. I had early formed my opinion of him and in spite of Miss Murray's objurgations, was fully convinced that he was a man of strong sense, firm faith, and ardent piety, but thoughtful and stern. And when I found that, to his other good qualities, was added that of true benevolence and gentle, considerate kindness, the discovery, perhaps, delighted me the more, as I had not been prepared to expect it. End of chapter 11